few surprises in store for Jack, 24 on BBC Two in just over 15 minutes. Here on BBC One, it's the start of a huge week for Little Mo. The trial starts in EastEnders tomorrow at 8. Please don't get the idea this girl is competitive. Running a successful family business. Started Sydney, male technician to the stars. Rule number one, never call, let him chase you. And our kid Darcy. <laughs> yeah, beautician extraordinaire. I can't decide whether I want Botox or laser. But now she's got a rival. I feel awful opening up across the street. You must hate me. And it's war. Who wants to win? We, we do. do. When shall we do it? Right now. You might buy this butter wouldn't melt there, but I don't. Hairdressers at war in work and blow. You said to play dirty. Cutting it. New drama starts Tuesday at 9 on BBC One. The song they have chosen is Evergreen by Will Young. Thank you. is BBC One. Now the news with Peter Sissons. Deadlock still on the West Bank. Israel stays until the terrorists are beaten. And Arafat tells America's peacemaker no pullout, no ceasefire. Finding the extra billions for the health service. Blair's budget warning. And records tumble in the world's greatest marathon. Good evening. America's efforts to stop Palestinians and Israelis killing each other came to nothing again today. Secretary of State Colin Powell saw Yasser Arafat and Ariel Sharon and found neither prepared to back off unless the other made the first move. But Mr Sharon did propose a regional peace conference presided over by America, something the Palestinians dismissed as a waste of time. Heading for the front line and the besieged city of Ramallah, the American Secretary of State is now fully engaged in this region's bloody and complex problems. Colin Powell desperately needs a ceasefire here, lives and American credibility on the line. The convoy headed straight for Yasser Arafat's compound. Israeli tanks, which have surrounded the place for weeks, were withdrawn to a respectful distance away from the cameras. Inside, the Americans delivered an uncompromising message. The Palestinian leader was told the suicide bombings must stop, that his words condemning terror must translate into actions. Uh, you tell us how it's a useful and destructive exchange with the Chairman Arafat and the members of his staff. And uh, we exchange a variety of uh, ideas and uh, discuss steps on how we can move forward. But moving forward will not be easy. Mr. Powell left knowing the Palestinians are still insisting that Israel withdraws from the West Bank before there can be a comprehensive truce. Despite the problems, the Americans are pressing on, determined to use the full weight of their superpower diplomacy to get a ceasefire. Frankly, though, things still aren't looking good. And if the Americans fail here, it's hard to see how anyone can succeed. Tonight, the Israeli Prime Minister has suggested new wide-ranging peace talks, which would include Saudi Arabia, Syria and Lebanon. But he still refuses to meet with Yasser Arafat, and that means the idea is almost certainly doomed to fail. Jeremy Cook, BBC News, Jerusalem. Over the last 16 days, the Palestinians have seen the centres of their towns destroyed and have had to survive without water and electricity. The Israelis live in constant fear of another suicide bomber on a bus or in a restaurant. Orla Girin has been finding out what people on both sides make of the latest diplomatic moves. The refugee camp of Jenin, or what's left of it, the Israeli military brought the media on a guided tour today, controlling what was and wasn't seen. No hiding the destruction, though. 12,000 people live in this camp. Now, it's like an earthquake zone. There was resistance here, fierce gun battles. 
No one knows for sure how many bodies may be buried beneath this rubble and if the dead were fighters or innocent civilians. This woman has just found the body of a loved one inside his own home. Israel has created a lot more hate. Where is Colin Powell, this old man demanded today? There's no milk for the children, no food, no electricity, and no sign of the troops pulling out all the American pressure, not getting much in the way of results. This is the reality across the West Bank. Israel is staying put, its tanks and troops still occupying Palestinian towns. And for civilians here, still a great deal of hardship. But Israel says it won't pull back until the job is done. And the job is making it safe for Israelis to walk the streets, to shop, to go to work. Many here want the troops to stay right where they are, choking Palestinian cities. And they want Colin Powell to mind his own business. In the end, it is our life. Our people dying every day. Until the army went inside, every, every day people was dying. She'd like to have killed some more. This is the face of a would-be bomber, a young mother, arrested on the way to blow herself up. More will follow, Palestinians say, till they get their own state. And Colin Powell's visit won't change that. Orla Guerin, BBC News, on the West Bank. And our World Affairs editor, John Simpson, joins us from Jerusalem. Now, John, what are, you, what are we to make of Sharon's regional peace conference plan that he pulled out of the bag tonight? Well, I think you've got to remember he doesn't want to seem too intransigent. He's not giving anything, uh, as far as we can tell, on withdrawing from the West Bank. But he doesn't just want to simply slap down a, a bland no to the Americans. And so he's proposes, he's come up with it, in fact, before and talked about it slightly. But now it's got a little bit more detail around it. And he's saying that the areas, governments around about here, um, and uh, the Palestinians themselves and Israel should uh, go into a conference rather like the Madrid Peace Conference, I suppose, 10 or so years ago, um, at which all of these things can be thrashed out, including, he says, the Saudi peace plan. Well, the Palestinians say it's a waste of time, they're not interested, but my guess is that if the Americans thought that that was a useful way forward, uh, everybody would actually draw fall into line and there would be one. John Simpson in Jerusalem, thank you. Police in Australia investigating the death of the British backpacker Caroline Stuttle have been taking DNA samples from witnesses. The 19-year-old was found dead four days ago in the town of Bundaberg near Brisbane. Detectives believe she was deliberately pushed from a bridge during a robbery. Here, the Prime Minister has given a strong hint that taxes will rise in Wednesday's budget to help pay for the NHS. Writing in a Sunday newspaper, he says the public see the scars of underfunding and realise they must pay for better services. The Conservatives say extra money alone isn't the answer. The government wants to pump billions of pounds into the NHS, but to deliver more beds and staff at hospitals like the Whittington, people will be expected to dig deep into their pockets. Talk of tax rises is no longer a new Labour taboo. Writing in today's Observer, Tony Blair signals that they're just around the corner. He says the public see the scars of underfunding. They realise, too, that you cannot have world-class schools and hospitals if you're not prepared to pay for them. The government's still not saying how, but when the Chancellor unveils his budget on Wednesday, his options are limited. He's already promised not to increase income tax rates. That could mean raising national insurance contributions instead. Reform, too, is promised, but not the kind being considered by the Tories, such as medical insurance used throughout Europe. Unless we get real change in the health service, we're not going to get the improvements that everyone wants to see. I'm afraid that what we're going to get on Wednesday is more talk, more taxes, no change and no difference. This Wednesday's budget will be Tony Blair's biggest political gamble. The sorts of tax rises being considered could hit middle income earners the hardest the very same people who helped bring new Labour to power. If they don't witness a dramatic improvement in the NHS over the next few years, then the government will suffer the consequences at the next election. Jonathan Beale, BBC News at the Whittington Hospital in North London. And our economics editor, Evan Davis, is outside number 11 Downing Street. Evan, everyone's speculating that the Chancellor will go for national insurance contributions, but why doesn't he just go where the big money is, the basic rate? Well, I mean, if you think, when Gordon Brown came into this house behind me five years ago there were lots of little taxes he could raise a little bit here a little bit there 
with people barely noticing. Now, he's used all those up, and I don't think there's any very easy way of raising money. He's pledged not to raise the basic or the higher rate of income tax, but he needs a really chunky proper tax to get his teeth into. And number two in the British tax system, the second most important tax with employer and employee contributions, is national insurance. So if he wants to raise a significant amount of money, it seems to me national insurance is the very obvious one for him to be looking at. So uh, how much does he need to raise and how much pain could that entail? Well, I think he needs to raise, if you do the maths, about five or ten billion pounds a year. He doesn't need that straight away because not all government departments are spending the money they've already got. But further down the line, say at the end of three years, that's the kind of amount he needs to keep public spending at the rate it's been rising over the last few years. Now that is a pretty significant amount of money and I think this will be a significant budget. But it'll also be significant because these will be blatant tax rises, all singing, all dancing tax rises, rather than just the Chancellor trying to slip them in almost unnoticed. Peter. Evan, Evan Davis, thank you. The most senior Catholic clergyman in the United States is embroiled in a sexual abuse scandal. The Archbishop of Boston, Cardinal Bernard Law, is under pressure to resign from his job. He's accused of knowing about paedophile priests but failing to remove them. Instead, the priests were moved from church to church without the parishioners being informed. Two American astronauts have successfully rewired the International Space Station to pave the way for a robot arm to be installed on its central girder. Over the next few years, the arm will be used to assemble other parts of the space station. Now, with news of a stunning London marathon and the rest of the day's sport, here's Rob Bonnet. Thanks, Peter. We'll start with football, and this year's FA Cup final in Cardiff will be a London derby between Arsenal and Chelsea. Both won their semi-finals by a goal to nil and both by own goals. Middlesbrough's Gianluca Festa put through his own net to give Arsenal their win at Old Trafford, while Fulham's Louis Saha had the final touch as Chelsea won at Villa Park. Never mind the Ferrari or the Lamborghini, the stretcher has become the most common mode of transport for key England players these past few days. Sol Campbell's sorry exit from Old Trafford today didn't need words from the watching England coach. The body language spoke volumes. At least the big defender should be fit again in three weeks and possibly available for the cup final. His team's appearance in it earned in a manner which sums up a disjointed match via a shinned own goal from Gianluca Festa. In truth, Arsenal should have spared their fans further anguish, but Sylvain Wiltord opted for the Johnny Wilkinson approach in front of the posts. And it needed the intervention of the seemingly ageless Lee Dixon to book their passage to Cardiff. And so to Villa Park, where the West London derby between Chelsea and Fulham was distinguished by the performances of the two goalkeepers. Fulham's van der Sar, and following easily the best move of the match, Chelsea's Curicini. The decisive moment, though, won't live in anybody's memory for long. John Terry's toe poke diverted in by Louis Sahar. That was always likely to be that, given that even in a hurried sale, Fulham couldn't buy a goal. Instead, Chelsea should have progressed more comfortably to a final which will inevitably feature the fewest number of Englishmen ever. Kevin Geary, BBC News. To golf and Tiger Woods bid for a second successive Masters title at Augusta National has been going well. Halfway through his final round, he'd stretched his lead over the rest of the field to three shots. This 20-foot chip-in at the sixth for a birdie returned him to 13 under par. Vijay Singh, Ernie Elson, and Ratif Goosen remained in contention, but Woods had the look of a man on his way to a third Masters title. Coverage continues on BBC One after the news. Today's San Marino Grand Prix was won by world champion Michael Schumacher in his Ferrari, a win that's taken him to a 14-point lead in the Drivers' Championship. Schumacher led from start to finish to claim his third win from this season's four races so far. His teammate Rubens Barrichello was in second place, and his brother Ralph third in his Williams. Well, it's been a record-breaking day at the London Marathon. In her first competitive race at the distance, Britain's Paula Radcliffe broke the UK record with a time that was the second fastest ever for a woman. And Kali Kanucci from the United States broke his own world record in the men's event. Here's Hazel Irvin. The Duke of York sets them on their way. It is still one of the most impressive sights in sport. 32,000 runners setting off from Blackheath on a 26.2-mile journey. As ever, there was a mixture of elite club, charity and costume participants. 
Amongst them Britain's Paula Radcliffe, who belied her marathon rookie status to charge away from a world-class field around the seven-mile mark. Behind her, the elite men's race was a less straightforward affair, as Ethiopia's Haile Gebru Selassie, another marathon debutante, found it impossible to shake off the close attentions of the field. Ahead of them all, however, were the wheelchair athletes. Again, another huge effort from new mum, Tani Gray-Thompson, earned her a sixth London title. The men's victory was claimed by another Briton, David Weir from Surrey. This was a record-breaking day as Paula Radcliffe became only the second woman to duck under the two hours, 19 minutes mark. I wanted to get the, the total world record to 18.47, so I was close to that, but I didn't realise how close until the last 800 metres, and uh, I'd given it everything that I could, I couldn't have gone any faster. And America's Khalid Kanuchi sheared four seconds off his own world best time after a thrilling sprint finished for the line. It's a world record. We've had world best times today, but surely the record for the longest London marathon will go to a gentleman who's dressed in a complete deep sea diver's outfit who expects to finish next Saturday. Hazel Irvin, BBC News, on the mile. He's still got a few days to go, hasn't he? That's the sport, Peter. Thanks, Rob. Now let's get the latest on the weather with David Brain. David. Thank you, Peter. Good evening to you. It's a good job it wasn't too hot in London for that deep sea diver. We've had some showery rain arrive through today and it looks like it's going to mostly move across a large part of eastern England and the way into the North Sea overnight tonight. So a much drier day tomorrow. I think some sunshine to enjoy. Tuesday though, the rain starts to come back. So a bit mixed over the next few days. You can see the radar picks up that rain quite well. It's been pushing steadily eastwards. It's slowed up a little bit over the last few hours and we still have a fair amount of cloud covering a good part of the United Kingdom, but some good holes now. Northern Ireland, Western Scotland and a large part of Western Britain seeing a little bit of mist forming, a little bit of fog perhaps here and there, but generally a lot of dry weather around. It's going to be a cold night as well in those areas that don't have the cloud. We're looking at temperatures dipping to as low as minus one to minus three. There's the forecast for tomorrow, not too bad. A few showers dotted around, especially for central and eastern parts of England. That cloud rather reluctant to move away from the more eastern parts of northern England and also eastern Scotland. But we'll find some sunshine coming through all the time, turning increasingly hazy though, as thicker clouds starts to move in off the Atlantic. Temperature wise, Similar to today, as we're looking at around 12 or 13, perhaps the highest in Southampton, also in the Channel Islands. And then looking further ahead, well, Tuesday brings another line of rain back across us. So the more eastern parts of the United Kingdom starts dry. They'll find an early frost as well. Then we'll find that rain started to come back across us. And that rain will go right up the central part of the UK during the course of Wednesday. So a mixed bag over the next few days. Perhaps the best of the dry weather will be tomorrow, apart from in eastern parts of England. Peter. David, thank you. Finally, tonight's main news again. Deadlock continues in the Middle East, despite today's talks with America's Secretary of State, Colin Powell. That's it for now. There are news updates throughout the night over on BBC News 24. Good night. Tuesday night on BBC One is going to be massive. Time for little Mo to take the stand in EastEnders. You can't win back now, Mo. He brought you here, didn't he? He asked for it. Do you understand? Liam is taken hostage. <laughs> and a brand new drama, cutting it. Hairdressers at war in work and love. You might buy this butter wouldn't know it, but I don't. You said to play dirty. Tune in on Tuesday to BBC One. Sometimes the smallest villages. Is your pad and Cornwall this big? Size isn't everything, Harris. Hide the biggest secrets. She didn't kill herself. She was murdered. Why would anyone want Hannah Day? The Inspector Lindley Mysteries. One man, one woman, together a deadly combination. Tomorrow at 8.30 on BBC One. The Tiger Woods story, from the early years to winning the 97 US Masters. That's 5 past 12 here on BBC One, after the climax of this year's exciting event, live from Augusta.
And welcome to the Augusta National and our continued coverage of this final round of the 66th Masters. If you've been with us on BBC Two, you'll know there's been the threat of rain that seems to have mercifully now receded and we're now well into the famous back nine of the Augusta National with history beckoning once again. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, gather round as Tammy and Alex take to the floor for the first time as man and wife. The song they have chosen is Evergreen by Will Young. Thank you. the very last ball. He's done it. A sense of style. The Snooker World Championship starts Saturday from 12 on BBC Two and continues throughout the week. And the nickname. Now that's interesting. Ali, the hairdresser. Please don't get the idea this girl is competitive. Running a successful family business. Arkid Sydney, male technician to the star. Rule number one, never call for him chasing. And Arkid Darcy, <laughs> yeah, beautician extraordinaire. I can't decide whether I want Botox or laser. But now she's got a rival. I feel awful opening up across the street. You must hate me. And it's war. Who wants to win? We, we do. do. When shall we do it? Right now. You might buy this butter wouldn't melt there, but I don't. Hairdressers at war in work and love. You said to play dirty. Cutting it. New drama starts Tuesday at 9 on BBC One. BBC One has the Tiger Woods story in five minutes after the weather view with David Brain. Hello again and welcome to Weatherview. We've had a little bit of rain through the last 24 hours or so after quite a dry spell, but most of the really wet weather has been happening again in central parts of Europe. This is a bit of a summary of what's been going on. Budapest has seen, well, half their monthly average rainfall fall in the space of a day. The same for parts of Croatia. They've seen a huge downpour of rain, 55 millimetres in fact, in the space of 24 hours. Now the satellite picture, picture picks up a fair amount of that cloud that's been coming and going across this more central part of Europe. Still some rain falling here, not just rain also. You see plumes of cloud coming out into the Mediterranean here. They're picking up a fair amount of moisture. The air is unstable, so we're seeing some thunderstorms as well. And they'll probably continue into the night. Now, somewhat drier conditions across the more western parts of the Mediterranean through tomorrow, but plenty of showers again. This line here will produce even more wet weather across southern Italy into the Greek islands. Also, as you can see, much more unsettled weather now across the more northern parts of Europe as we change to a more mobile westerly flow, bringing in the moisture off the Atlantic. Now, we've had some of that today. We've had a bit of rain here and there across Scotland, Northern Ireland, the more central parts of England and Wales. It is slowly moving eastwards, but it's kind of slowed up over the last six hours or so. Clear skies, though, for a good part of Scotland, Northern Ireland and Western Wales means here some frost, temperatures down to as low as minus three in the sheltered glens of Scotland. But we keep a fair amount of cloud across these more eastern parts of England, and that'll produce a few showers for the rest of the night. In fact, they'll be around tomorrow morning as well. So some showery rain here, elsewhere fine and dry. A bit more cloud for northeast England and the eastern parts of Scotland, just coming in off the North Sea during the course of the afternoon, could produce a few spots of rain. Now then, temperatures, well, up to 12 or 13 degrees, not too bad. Only nine in the far north of Scotland. And then looking further ahead, while we start to see these weather fronts get somewhat closer, by Tuesday, knocking on the door of Western Britain, and then lingering for a time by the time we get to Wednesday, a bit of a bump on that weather system, holding it back a bit, through by Thursday, and as I say, towards the end of the week, somewhat drier and brighter conditions. Now, we do change the wind direction in the next five days, generally from the southwest, and in fact, right at the end of the week, a bit of a hint of mild air coming up from the south. A change in the colour of arrows, the wind direction from the south, lifting the temperatures. And that shows up very nicely on our daytime temperature charts. We start to see a bit more of the yellow and orange appear as the warmer hues develop. We're looking at temperatures up to 15 or 16 degrees. 
Well, back to Tuesday's forecast. There's that rain coming in from the west. Bit of brightness to start the day in eastern parts of England. Still some cloud lingering in the far northeast of Scotland. It should brighten up here through the afternoon. And then by Wednesday, many central areas seeing that line of patchy rain steadily marching its way eastwards. It should all be through by Thursday. So Thursday, a better day for all of us. A few showers dotted around, but some sunshine as well. The exception, again, the northeast of Scotland. And then on Friday, for many areas, it should be largely a dry story. That's all from me. Bye for now. You can have fast and easy access to the latest BBC news, sport and weather on digital television whenever you want. Simply press the red key or text button on your remote to get a snapshot of all the latest headlines, sports results and weather. It's all available on BBC I all the time. BBC I, interactive services on digital television and the net. More power to your finger. Bringing the good old times back to life. Peace and quiet. <laughs> Their father and son, both doctors. But can they be partners? A brand new series starring James Bolan and Michael French. Welcome home, son. Born and Bred starts next Sunday at 8 on BBC One. Beautiful. Cheeky. We've never had it so good. Now on BBC One, because of the early conclusion to the US Masters, we go a little early to the film, whose star is the golfing legend himself. This is the Tiger Woods story. night on BBC One is going to be massive. Time for little Mo to take the stand in EastEnders. They can't win